Hi everyone, Dr. Matt here, and in this video we're going to look at intracranial hemorrhages, sometimes known as intracranial hematomas. In this video we're going to compare and contrast three subtypes. We have epidural hematomas, subdural hematomas, and subarachnoid hematomas. Specifically, when I look at the locational differences within the skull, the mechanism that leads to the bleed, the blood vessels involved, the common signs and symptoms that you would see in your patient. When scanning or doing a CT of the skull brain, what kind of image would you expect to see the differences? And then the treatment management that would be used. But first, I want to draw your attention to this image here. So we've got a skull and brain, and we've done a frontal cut. So we've cut the person into a frontal plane, which gives an anterior and a posterior part, and we're looking inwards from the back. Here we can see the skull on the outer part, that's in black, and the inner regions of the brain we can see in black also. But what I've drawn here in blue is the first layer of the meninges, which we call the dura mater. So this is the tough mother, which kind of adheres to the skull, and it comes inwards, which then adheres to the arachnoid layer, and then the most intimate layer to the brain is the pia mater. And those three collectively are known as the meninges. These are going to be important to keep in your mind because this allows the definition or the terms that we use for these three different types of bleeds. All right, so let's focus on the first one, which is called an epidural. Epi means upon the dura. So where we have the blue here, the bleed's going to be on top of it between the dura and the skull. So there's a potential space there, and this is where the bleed's going to take place. So the location is on top of the dura. Dura matter. Okay, so this is also sometimes known as an extrural bleed, but commonly we're going to use epidural. So the mechanism behind this bleed, so an epidural basically... 1% to 5% of all traumatic head injuries will result in this type of bleed. It's more common in the younger population, so the average age is between 20 to 30 years of age for an epidural bleed. Basically, what's going to happen is we have a traumatic head injury, THI, which will result in a skull fracture. So about 70 to 90% of epidural bleeds will have a skull fracture associated with it. The most common location is in the temporal region. The part of the skull there is called the terion, and it's the thinnest part of the skull. Right underneath that is a special artery, which we call the middle meningeal artery. So what could happen in this specific type is the skull fractures, so it comes inwards, ruptures the blood vessel, so we have skull fracture, a rupture, to, I'll say, a blood vessel, BV, okay, which now leads to the bleed. So the bleed now takes hold, that's the hemorrhage, and starts to fill that potential space up, which we saw between the dura and the skull. So that's going to start filling that space up. Okay, so now we have a bleed entering potential space. And that space is between the skull and the dura matter. So that's going to be the, that, why we call it the epidural bleed. So the blood vessel, 85% of epidural bleeds is arterial, which leaves us with 15%, which is this kind of region here, which we call the dural sinuses. The dural sinuses is where the venous blood, which drains the brain, goes into and drains away, essentially going into your jugular veins. So the dural sinuses can be a cause of an epidural bleed, but by far the most common is arterial. All right, so just to recap, we have a skull fracture, which is found in 70 to 90% of individuals with an epidural bleed, leading to a rupture of the blood vessel, so it breaks the blood vessel, the bleed starts, which closes the skull back off, enters the potential space, and now starts to expand. So the symptoms that we would see, generally with the head injury, we would see a loss of consciousness, so I'll put LOC, and then in about 50% of cases, there's gonna be a lucid period where the person regains consciousness and is aware of their surroundings. As the bleed starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger, we get an increase in intracranial pressure, which basically means that this bleed is taking up space in the skull, there's gonna be an increase in pressure now in the skull, which is gonna have certain effects. 
And this is going to lead to what we call a triad, which means three things, which is going to result in a high blood pressure, a drop in heart rate, and irregular respiratory rate. And that's a classic intracranial pressure change, or an increase in intracranial pressure change, which is classic epidural bleed symptoms. We also will see headaches, vomiting, and on the side of the bleed, we can see a dilated pupil. So if this is on the left side and we put light or shine light in the left pupil, it would stay dilated. The reason for that is that pressure is going to start pushing down, compress the ocular motor nerve, which is the, the pupil constrictor. So that turned off. How does it look in imaging? Well, if you scanned in a CT, so if we did a CT scan, what would happen is this bleed looks kind of like a lens the way that it starts to grow. Now, the reason for that is it's between the skull and the dura mater, and that's going to start to move in that potential space. But as it becomes moves up to suture joints, because there's going to be a suture joint here in the skull, that part of the dura is adherent to the skull. So it can't kind of keep going around like so. It stops there, which means it's restricted in the way it expands, and it starts to bulge up. So the appearance is biconcave kind of looking like a lens. So that's the appearance that it will look, which is going to be important when you contrast it to the subdural bleeds. The treatment here, it's an emergency. And what would have to be done is, depending on the size of it, if it's a smaller bleed, it may be just a, a watch and wait, looking at the change in ICP and symptomatology change. So that would be a watch and wait. But if it's a large, if it's a large bleed, they will have to evacuate that clot, either by removing a whole section of the skull, called a craniotomy, or through other procedures to take that, that clot out of the skull. So that's the epidural bleeds. Now let's move across to the subdural. So the subdural is going to be between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. So it's going to be under the dura. Under dura or between dura and arachnoid, or the arachnoid membrane. So that's where the subdural bleeds will take place. Now the mechanism here is going to be slightly different to what we saw with the epidural bleeds. Basically the first thing we need to think about is all the brain receives arterial supply by cortical arteries, and they're going to be actually located in the subdural, sorry, the subarachnoid space, so in here. So that's supplying brain with arterial blood. And we're going to have venous blood, which is going to be the superficial cortical veins, being drained in the subarachnoid space, but it has to get back into the dura sinuses. And it has to get, it does that, these bridging veins, we call it, bridging veins go back in between the dura to go into the dural sinuses. And it's these bridging veins that become ruptured. So the blood vessels are actually bridging veins and about 80% of cases will be those types of blood vessels. About 20% of cases will be cortical arteries, but they are less than one millimeter in size. The mechanism that leads to a subdural bleed is trauma. So like we saw with the epidural bleeds, subdural, about 10% of mild to moderate head injuries I'll just put HI, results in a subdural bleed, whilst about 20% of serious head injuries result in a subdural bleed. So they're more common than the epidural bleeds. The trauma it also depends on the individual's age. So trauma in a younger adult is usually by a motor vehicle accident. In an elderly person, it's usually a fall. And in infants, it's through the shaking baby syndrome. So shaking the baby, which causes a coup, counter coup, acceleration, deceleration injury. So trauma is the most common type of mechanism. This then leads to the vein rupturing. Now, comparing this to the epidural, the veins rupturing is going to be a slower bleed. So it's a slower bleed than the arterial. And that's going to then result in an acute or possibly a chronic 
subdural hematoma. So in the acute, what happens is we have the bleed and it will start to accumulate. I'll show you over here. It's going to be between the arachnoid membrane and the lower part of the dural, and that's going to start to bleed into here and take up space. Again, it's a potential space between the dura and the arachnoid membrane. It's not in the subdural space, and it's going to start to accumulate. The difference it's going to see here is this is restricted between the skull and the dura, and it's not going to be able to expand past suture points, whereas this one can. So it can actually go in a further region which makes it actually look crescent shaped. So on the CT, it will look crescent shaped. And that's gonna be the big difference between the appearance on a CT between an epidural and subdural bleed. This is gonna be a crescent shape. This is gonna be bioconcaved. But this is gonna be a slower bleed and it will start to grow and grow and grow. So this is gonna be leading to the acute phase. So in acute subdural hematomas, as the bleed is growing, we will see more focal effects. So the way it starts to push on the brain and as it's taken up space is gonna cause focal effects, which depend on what part of the brain's affected. So if it was in, so we'll say focal effects. So if it was in the frontal lobe, we might see changes to behavior or motor weaknesses. If it's in the parietal lobe, we might see more sensory. So changing in the way that sensations are processed. The focal will be more acute in the presentation. And the presentation, because it's a, a, a vein or a slower breed, it's bleed, it's going to be between 48 and 72 hours to see the symptoms. Now, in many cases, the slower bleed, as it starts to take up space, that can compress the actual bleed itself, as well as the increased intracranial pressure. And that can do something what we call a tamponade, which kind of blocks off the bleed. So that can actually stop in its acute phase, and you may not get any symptoms. But as the clot's trying to resolve, water or fluid goes into it, which makes it expand again, which leads to now to a chronic form of subdural hematomas. And these are gonna come much later, so these are after two weeks. And that's because of that osmotic effect and the clot getting bigger, or the hematoma getting bigger. And so in this case, we're not gonna see no focal effects compared to the acute types, rather we're gonna see changes in ICP, intracranial pressure, but the brain might also be herniating. So it might get pushed to different regions as it's growing, it might get pushed down or to the side or a midline shift. So that's gonna be the difference between the acute and the chronic. As I said, the CT will be seen in the crescent. And then when we go to the treatment, again, this would be an emergency. And the way that it's treated would depend on the size or thickness of the clot, the ICP, so how much the intracranial pressure is increasing, and if there is any midline shifts. And based on the characteristics of those will determine the way that it's uh, managed, whether it will be done through diuretics to take the intracranial pressure away or reduce the ICP, or whether we would do a clot removal like we saw over here with the epidural. Last, we are left with the subarachnoid hematomas. These are actually a form of stroke. So I've already done a video on stroke, so I encourage you to have a look at that. But these fall under the characteristics of a hemorrhagic stroke. So there can be a hemorrhagic stroke that is a bleed into the parenchyma of the brain tissue itself, whereas this bleed, so about 10% of strokes, are in this form. So this form is where we have a blood vessel rupture into the subarachnoid space. So that's gonna be the space in here, this big gap here, which is between the pia and the arachnoid membrane. As I said, that's where the blood vessels are and that's where this bleed is gonna take place. So it's between arachnoid and pia matter, or in the subarachnoid space. So in terms of the mechanism behind this type of bleed, there are two main, there are aneurysm based and non-aneurysm based. The most common in that would be trauma or what we call a arterial venous malformation. I'll put an AVM, which basically means a tangling up between the veins and the artery, which puts a weaknesses in that 
um, top of blood vessel and that can lead to a bleed into the subarachnoid space. Trauma, like we said earlier, earlier, this could just be from a fall or a head injury. An aneurysm is where you have a weakening in the blood vessel, it starts to pouch out and that leads to a possible rupture. The most common is what we call a saccule or berry aneurysm, which most likely is in a region of the blood vessels in the brain called the circle of Willis. In any case, the blood will start to accumulate into the subarachnoid space so that we have a bleed into the subarachnoid space. And that can then irritate blood vessels in there, which cause vasospasm, vasospasm. And that can lead to a constriction in blood to parts of the brain, which can lead to ischemia and stroke-like symptoms. It can lead to a blockage in CSF, which can lead to an increase in intracranial pressure and that condition known as hydrocephalus. The blood vessels involved with a subarachnoid bleed is always going to be arterial. And the signs and symptoms is a headache. And usually this is what we call a thunderclap headache or the worst headache. So I'll put thunderclap. So that's the worst headache ever experienced. We're going to see changes in ICP, so we'll see vomiting, or vomiting is common. And because the blood is also irritating the meninges, we're going to have neck stiffness, which is sometimes known as nuclear rigidity. So that's the blood is irritating the meninges, which makes it difficult to move the head and makes it stiff, which is painful. In terms of how it would look on a CT, well, the, ble the bleeding is in the subarachnoid space, so we'd actually see the blood following the sulci and the gyri of the brain itself. So it's going to start to accumulate like so, and that's going to be a different appearance as we saw as the biconcave or the crescent shaped. If it was a subarachnoid bleed, you would see more deeper in the brain, you would just see it in the CT more as an accumulation. But I'll say here, following the gyri sulci of brain. And then finally, we're left with the treatments where we'd have to address the bleed of the artery, and this would be done by clipping. So that would clamp off and stop further bleeding. Or if it's an aneurysm base, they may do some coiling, which leads to the clotting around that pouching or that aneurysm itself. So hopefully now you have a better understanding of the three subtypes of hematomas, that specifically their location, the mechanism that leads to the bleed, the blood vessel that's most commonly involved, the signs and symptoms that can distinguish between the three, the CT imaging appearance that would distinguish between the three and what treatments simply can be used to manage these three different types of hematomas. Please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.